Good evening and welcome to our March 13th, 2018 Ogden City Council meeting. Um, let the roll call reflect that all council members are present with the exceptions of Council Member White who has asked to be excused tonight. Um, we will turn the time to Vice Chair Nadalski for the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you'll... Thank you, Chair Heyer. Uh, we've asked Aiden to come help us. Aiden, if you come forward. I, I gave you the, the word too soon because Aiden's going to do that. So sit back down again. <laughs> Not you, Aiden. Yeah, Aiden, you come back up. Come on up, bud. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, ask everybody to rise. Ask everybody to stand up. Please, please rise. Please rise. I'm sorry. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> I'm sorry, Aiden, I, I kind of got... Thank you, Aiden. Jump started there. Good job. <coughs> if you would now please join us for a moment of silence. Thank you. We appreciate all of you being here tonight, and I suspect that most of you are probably here for the next item on our uh, agenda, which is a recognition for Paul R. Carr. We've uh, asked our Mayor Caldwell if he would present that for us, so we'll turn the time to him. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that, and what an honor to have you all in here. You guys are an amazing team, and uh, unfortunately, I don't get a chance to work with you all day today, but I do hear stories and the service that Paul has given to this organization is I think amazing. So it's a great honor for me to read this. So what I'd like to present is a joint resolution of the Ogden City Council and Mayor honoring Paula R. Carr for her contributions to the Ogden Justice Court. And so if you'll forgive me a lot of legal language and lots of whereases. Whereas Paula R. Carr began her court career in 1975, where she worked in various capacities in the Ogden City Court and the Ogden City School District, including in-court clerk and several supervisory functions. And whereas beginning in 1992, Paula was appointed as a clerk of the court for the second judicial district. And whereas in 1996, after the Utah legislature consolidated the circuit, limited jurisdiction and district general district jurisdiction courts, Paula was appointed clerk of the consolidated courts. And whereas in 2006, Paula retired from the second district court and was appointed Ogden City Justice Court Administrator and tasked with creating a justice court for Ogden City. And whereas Paula was able to hire five employees with court experience from the district court, including current assistant court administrator, Debbie Colvin. And whereas Paula was instrumental in leading the evolution of Ogden, Justi uh, Ogden Justice Court to its current position with a staff of 20, including two full-time judges, one contract judge, two warrant officers, and 15 court clerks. And whereas the Ogden Justice Court serves as a role model for courts throughout the state and is frequently called upon to conduct training sessions for other courts, and whereas the Ogden Justice Court consistently ranks in the top percentage of measurable court standards such as filing to disposition, case pending, and other quantifiable categories, and whereas Paula ha has been a respected leader, mentor, and friend to her colleagues in the Justice Court and throughout Ogden City, and whereas after an exceptional 43-year career in Northern Utah justice system, the last 12 of which were in the service for Ogden City, Paula R. Carr will be retiring her services here to move on to her own pursuits. Now therefore be it resolved by members of the Ogden City Council and the Mayor of Ogden City that we hereby express our sincere appreciation to Paula R. Carr for her professionalism, dedication, and professional, her personal commitment to Ogden City and Northern Utah. Your legacy is reflected in your many valuable contributions as administrator of the Ogden Justice Court and the continued operation of an exemplary justice court system. 
Best wishes for you and your continued success and happiness. This was passed and adopted on this 13th day of March, 2018. Congratulations, thank you very much. That recognition, and thank you, Mayor Caldwell, to be a part of your administration. It's been one of the joys of my life. First of all, let me thank Mark for having the uh, confidence in me to give me this position. Second, thank you, Greg, for listening to Mark when he said to keep me on when you took over his place. Uh, this has truly been one of the honors of my lifetime. Um, I worked in the court system, as you heard from the lengthy, lengthy recitation, for a number of years and thought, uh, this is what I'd do if I could start my own court. This is what I would take from the lessons that I had learned from the district court and the things that I would do differently. And thankfully, Mark and the council gave me that opportunity. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to thank my wonderful, wonderful staff including all of the judges here, Judges Lockwood, Stuckey, Renstrom, uh, West. Thank you, Judge West, for appearing here today. They make me look good. They make Ogden City look good. And more importantly, they make the Justice Court look good, which isn't always easy. Again, thank you. This means the world to me. Thank you. Thank you. So, Paula, we have a, 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 this recognition for you, and if you'd like to come up and bring your family or whoever else you'd like to invite, we'd like to take a few pictures. And, and we, we do have to make this official first. Oh, yep. yeah. So, yes, so uh, I will look for a motion to uh, approve this. Uh, Chair Heyer, we'll, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the joint resolution as proposed. Second it. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Vice Chair Nadolski, second by Vice, er, uh, Council Member Stevens. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, now we would like you to come up, yeah. accept your plaque, and have some pictures taken. You can bring your, uh, those who came to support you as well. We'd like to get them in the photo. So come on up. We had the football team here a couple of weeks ago, so they'll fit. They'll fit. Yeah. yeah, you can get them. Come on, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I was glad I never ran into you over there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Thanks. Pleasure. Congratulations. Thank you, Yes. You want all these guys right there? You right there? All right. <laughs> Yes. I'm not part of the team. Let's we, no, we need we need family. Anyone? They're part of the team. Great. Come back. Come back. Come back. Oh, we got more. Sorry. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm good, really. We we got lots of ease. I'm standing on my stool. He's shorter than he Yeah. Oh, shit. You're okay. Wellness. Oh, well, that was fun. And I'm sure you're all here uh, to stay for the rest of the meeting. We have a lot of fun things ahead. Um, you're certainly welcome, but we understand if you would like to step out. So we'll uh, kind of pause for that if, if you'd like to. Okay, 
We'll move on to the next item, which is uh, the approval of minutes. Uh, first is the regular uh, meeting of uh, August 22nd, 2017, and the work session of October 3rd, 2017. Councilmember Stevens? Yes, Mr. Chair, they're correct. Then we have the special meeting of October 10th, 2017, and the joint work session of December 5th, 2017. Uh, Vice Chair Nadalski? Uh, thanks, Chair Hire. They were accurate to my recollection. And then the regular meeting of, of December 19th, 2017, Councilmember Blair. Yes, thank you, Chair Heyer. I have reviewed those and found them to be accurate. And the joint work session of January 9th, 2018, Councilmember Trewerka. Um, Chair Heyer, I see one correction to the minutes needed, and that's the chair signature should be changed to your name instead of uh, Councilmember White's. Okay, we got that, Paula. Is that Okay, and then finally the closed executive session of December 19th, 2017, and work session of January 23rd, 2018. Councilmember Lopez. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Heyer, I review the minutes found to be accurate, and I move that we approve the minutes as presented with a note the, the correction uh, raised by uh, Councilmember Chaborka. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Lopez, seconded by Councilmember Blair to approve the minutes. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Okay, next item is our common consent portion of our agenda. Uh, the only item there today is financial principles, which we do yearly. Uh, I will look for a motion. Um, motion. Uh, Chair, hired that we approve the common consent items as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Lopez, seconded by Councilmember Blair to approve the common consent agenda. This is also as a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. Next item is reports from the Planning Commission. Uh, item concerning the Central Business District Zone Minimum Lot Size Amendment. Welcome, Mr. Montgomery. He's wearing his uh, St. Patrick's green today. That's right. You won't see me on Saturdays, so. <laughs> <clears throat> that one right there. Thank you. So this is actually a petition that had been filed by the uh, Community and Economic Development uh, Department to look at uh, change to the provisions in the Central Business District regarding uh, densities. So just a little brief history. The uh, areas shown in blue and, and dark blue are the areas of the CBD. And in 1989, the city changed what the zoning had been in the downtown area from various zones, C3, M1, M2, to what we call a CBD zone today. But in developing that, many of the standards of the C3 zone were, were kept and carried over into the uh, CBD zone, and other things were added, for example, reviews by the, the Planning Commission and the Mayor in approving projects there. Over time, we've gradually tried to transform the CBD from, a, from what have been C3 provisions to really a downtown core design. And as we make revisions and try to better improve what we have downtown, it calls for amendments to the ordinance every so often. Um, again, the original purposes of the CBD, why we created it from the different zones we had, was to improve the image of the city, to um, a maximum, maximize the ability to mix uses and also separate out uses that aren't appropriate, and to increase the activity that takes downtown and the property values. And also to look at treating, as we look for downtown development, similarly, which is why this ordinance is being proposed. So currently, there are two different standards in the ordinance. The first one says that if you're building a multiple family project, you have a certain maximum density <coughs> It is based on the idea that for the, the first two units, you have to have a 5,000 square foot area of lot. And then for each additional unit, you've got to have 750 square feet for each, each unit. These are the same standards that are found in the R5 and the C3 zone. And they apply to projects such as Colonial Court. There's another provision in the CBD ordinance, again, same, <coughs> doing the same type of thing, but it says if you have multiple family above commercial, 
there is no density requirement. You don't have to have minimum lot areas for a number of units. So uh, what we did in the junction with some of those buildings where we have retail on the main floor and apartments above, they were built without any density standards. So you see um, in the downtown we have really two different regulations regarding multiple family housing. If you're above residential, above commercial, you don't have any density standards. If you are only residential, you do have a density standard, which seems to be counterintuitive of what we want to have happen downtown. Um, so what, what's being proposed is to remove that minimum area requirement for any type of multiple family, whether it is uh, standalone or has residential uh, below it. Uh, the other standards would still apply, parking standards, landscaping standards, and all the variations that go with that in the CBD. But we'd make, make it so that any building that is in downtown that wants to become residential can do so based on how they can configure the building, meet the parking needs, rather than strictly do you have enough lot area in the terms of a number to accomplish this. This increases the residential density. It makes some of the older buildings that were commercial or manufacturing, it gives them an opportunity to become something different. As we all know, the markets are changing, and sometimes commercial may not be the only option for downtown. And in fact, some of the things we want to have happen is more of a downtown population. So allowing these buildings to be reused becomes very important. This ordinance, as we, we talk about, we look, do it, does it comply with the general plan? We look at it, it says it does. It, what it looks to provide additional residential units downtown in a key area where density is important, that being the downtown area. And it provides a variety of housing types. So we have, in most areas, single family or, or smaller multiple family projects. But downtown, you can have a much higher density project. And so that, those variety of housing and housing <coughs> options are provided by this revision. Um, and this increased density then helps in developing the overall area of downtown. It also supports the, the community plan, the CBD plan, in that it talks about having higher density and increasing those densities where transit is important and walkability is important. So again, letting the, the site itself dictate how development occurs rather than a, 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 a module of saying, well, if you, you've got to have this that much size or otherwise you can't get the density you need. So we feel this is an important consideration and this takes into account the things that are happening downtown in circulating people downtown, the BRT that will come, the green bike share that will be coming, other types of things. I wanted to give you an example of what would have this ordinance meant if, if Tower View, which is a project that's been developed, didn't have the retail in front of it. So with the retail in front, it was allowed to create 128 units on the project based on meeting the other criteria, which works out to 82 units an acre. If it did not have the retail in front, the maximum could have only been 86 units or a third a loss in terms of number of total units based on a lot area coverage requirement of, of what we're trying to revise tonight. So you see, one of the very successful projects in downtowns would severely have been hampered had it not had the retail level and took advantage of that one provision we have. But it wouldn't make sense to say, well, just that small amount of retail makes all the difference in terms of those, uh, you know, 40 more units. Because they, it doesn't really occupy that much more space. So we're, we're trying to be consistent in how we look at multiple family developments in the city. The Planning Commission recommended on a six to one vote uh, to recommend approval of revising the ordinance by eliminating the lot area requirements in the CBD. This, again, allows redevelopment to take place in existing buildings, increases density and economic vital vitality. And as you see with uh, the Urban 3 model of what they did for Ogden City, where the purple is, that's the area we really want to concentrate those densities on, which have been reflected in the property values that, that, that take place. You just compare that to the rest of the city. And it makes a more efficient land use of the downtown. So that is the recommendation <coughs> from the Planning Commission to you on this item. Um, if I might ask a question, uh, you know, when we talk about the CBD, um, did you make any distinction between that and the CBDI? No, we felt both are, would be appropriate to have that, those same provisions. Okay. Um, and, well, okay, that's my question. Is there any other, is there any questions for Greg about this? 
We had one that was. We had one that was a descending vote. Can you example? Clear that up. One of the things that, uh, well, Commissioner Scaddy was, was in favor of this. He wanted some more, more requirements placed on that. Uh, if you are developing multiple family, that you have built-in parking on your lot, and that become part of the requirement. We don't have that requirement in the ordinance. We didn't add that into this provision. So, so strictly that, looking at, at lot areas in the staff report, it's talking about an alternative option that he was in. He was. Uh, in favor of an alternative mm -hmm. option, which would help decrease the parking demand in the future as more transit was available. So can you maybe help us understand what that alternative option really was? Well, that, that alternative option was to require developments to build their own parking like Tower View did. I see. Okay. To have it enclosed, to see if you can put it inside the building, again, to, to create a more dense area. The other part of it, uh, part of what we've already done in, in that we've reduced the parking requirements from two to one and a half uh, previously to, to, again, in the downtown area to try to uh, facilitate uh, residential development. And how would that affect uh, structures that are already in place that don't have that parking? Would it have yeah, what it, what it would do for those structures in place, you have a different parking provision that says you could acquire parking within 500 feet of your project right. and it'd be at that lower density of 1.5 stalls instead of two stalls per unit any other questions that 500 feet is off-site uh, parking Correct. is that right yeah can you give an example of that well uh, the junction is a good example for that in terms of some of those uh, buildings actually use this the parking structure rather than their own lot they're on so it is within 500 feet of that building on the lot that sits, it's on a separate lot, uh, so that's allowed. Um, this building, for example, we use the Bank of Utah for some of the parking requirements, which is not on this lot, but it's on a, another lot. Um, so there's, there's some of those types of buildings that, that do, do get their parking from other locations. Did the Planning Commission think, uh, well, Probably uh, com uh, Commissioner Scaddy thought that maybe the parking would be a, uh, a limited resource and that we do have limited parking in downtown. And I, I imagine I got the impression that he thought it would, uh, it would be a problem for well, us to I move think, forward. I think that part of it is, like I said, having it really built into the site itself rather than having to depend off site for, for the parking, but not having it. It's a surface parking lot. Right. And those are things that, you know, the economics we have to take a look at. And as we move forward with other design criteria for the CBD, we'll start to look into those type of things, too. I think this proposal has a lot of good things for it. And, and uh, I, uh, I can see where they're looking at. Uh, and we're always trying to increase the density of downtown to revitalize the downtown area and, and that area there. But uh, not every... Uh, project can have parking within within itself on site parking so yeah especially if you're trying to use existing buildings that'd be that's hard to do so that's where you, that provision of what is within 500 feet becomes important any other questions okay thank you we would like to accept input from the public on this is there anyone that would like to speak to this issue Okay, seeing none, uh, I will look for a motion. Chair Heyer, I would go ahead and make a motion that we adopt proposed ordinance 2018-6. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Blair, <coughs> seconded by Vice Chair Nadolski, to approve ordinance 2018-6. This is a roll call vote. Councilmember Blair? Aye. Councilmember Chaburka? Aye. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Uh, no. Vice Chair Nadolski? Aye. Chair Heyer? Aye. That passes. Chair Heyer, excuse me, may I note that you said that the resolution was seconded by Councilmember Nadolski, was seconded by Councilmember Lopez. Okay. Just for the record. I, uh, I, I guess I heard both, but. Uh, oh. Uh, but that's okay. I didn't hear Councilmember Seconded, so okay. 
<laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I just didn't hear it. I Sorry. know it, it must have got a third from. Excuse me. No, no, no. Okay. Please. Okay. I didn't hear you. Sorry. Oh, great. Sorry. Well, that, that also passes um, five to one. Uh, Councilmember Stevens, do you, you care to explain your no <laughs> vote? I agree with it that we need to encourage as much density as we can in the downtown area. Uh, parking is such a premium down here that uh, I think we need to continue to work on our uh, parking master plan to see if we can address some of those issues. And I, I felt like uh, um, that was, uh, the parking was a, a real interesting item to, to look at. Uh, surely if, uh, if a company can build a garage 500 feet away, um, uh, I, th I think that can be a problem of attracting tenants into that area. So, but I think our uh, goal for the city is to work out a, a parking situation where we can accommodate uh, some of that uh, situations in the city. Okay, thank you. Next item on our agenda is a public hearing uh, concerning fiscal years 2019 through 23 capital improvement plan. Mr. Symes, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, while uh, we get that up, I'll just um, thank you. Just do a quick introduction. Um, <coughs> as you mentioned, this is the CIP for uh, fiscal years 2019 to 2023. Um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of uh, background. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on that uh, since we've gone over this uh, in the work session. Uh, but this, uh, this is a definition from, your, uh, from our code. Uh, it basically just says this is a five-year rolling plan that we update each year. Uh, a quick reminder of, of what a capital improvement project is. It's anything that's over $30,000 that adds to the city's physical plant. And this includes both new construction and uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation of uh, elements of that physical plant. It's also the acquisition and long-term lease of land and then any feasibility studies that uh, would uh, lead to a CAP project in the future. So some of the main sources of, uh, of uh, funding for the CIP uh, include the general fund. This, this includes uh, BDO lease revenue, um, the Prop 1 funding or active transportation funding that you can see, um, and any other one-time funding that we might get. Uh, it includes federal and state grants, uh, BNC road funds, and then utility enterprise funds. Uh, it can also include bonds and then some other things like uh, the ramp grants, uh, WACOG funding, and some other things. So the plan itself and the process uh, helps us do a few different things. So primarily it helps us to identify what our capital needs are. Uh, it helps us to establish that long-term goal and helps us to, um, to plan for those investments. Uh, the reason the Planning Commission takes a look at this and gives you a recommendation is to ensure that the projects are consistent with our general plan. And then it informs uh, the budget and helps us set priorities. And of course, like the budget itself, this is definitely a, a policy document that reflects uh, the priorities of the city. So if we get into the plan itself a little bit, um, uh, this plan, this uh, 19 to 23 plan, there are 91 projects total, uh, 78 um, projects are general fund or non-utility enterprise fund projects, um, seven uh, utility fund projects, six ramp grant projects. Um, there were 22 new projects added to this plan uh, that were not in last year's plan. Uh, 14 projects that were in last year's plan were removed from this, uh, this year's plan. Uh, as you can see there, some of them were funded, some of them were just removed uh, to be replaced at a future time if, uh, if the project becomes feasible. Um, 13 projects that are in the plan now had significant changes from last year, um, and this is, this is my number, but uh, uh, there were 13 projects that had a, a cost differential of more than 20%. And then uh, the total of all the projects uh, for all five years is just under $272 million. So this is a breakdown of... Um, of uh, departments and uh, their projects. I'm not going to go through all of these numbers. This information is in the, in the <coughs> packet. And we've gone over this information in the work sessions. Uh, but this just shows the upcoming fiscal year funding, future funding, and total funding. Um, all of these uh, uh, departments here are general fund um, departments. And then here we've got uh, all the enterprise fund uh, departments, and it shows the same thing there. 
But when we look at the upcoming fiscal year and what's in the CIP for that, uh, these are some totals by fund. Uh, so you can see the general fund is just under $14 million. Um, federal grants, just under $5.5 million. There's nothing in state grants uh, shown for FY19 in the CIP. Um, the BNC road funds showed just over $237,000. Um, it's important to note that this is not all of the BNC road funds that we get. These are just funds that are specifically identified with uh, capital projects. So there are, we, we do get more money than that, um, but a lot of it just goes into general fund for other uh, support uh, costs, but not specifically for uh, projects. So this is just uh, the ones that are associated with projects. Um, just under $7.5 million for enterprise funds, and then uh, just over $30 million uh, in the other category. And this does, as I mentioned, include WACOG, some RDA funding, and, and uh, some other grants. So total for FY19 is uh, just over $57 million. So one of the things that we asked you to do at our last work session was to rank the projects as a council. Um, when you get uh, the CIP from the administration, uh, it does come with a ranking, uh, the administration's ranking of all the projects. Uh, we don't ask that you rank all the projects, we just ask for your top 10. And uh, this chart here shows uh, your top 10 compared to uh, the, the project ranking by the administration. So the far left column is uh, how your ranking uh, shook out. And then uh, the second to the left shows uh, what the administration's ranking was. And uh, again, this information is in the packet, and I did send this to you last week if you do have any questions on that. Um, as you can see, there were a couple of projects that made it to the council's top 10 that were not in the administration's top 10. Um, the hostess plant mixed use development and the Lester Park improvements uh, were bumped up in your ranking as opposed to uh, the administration's ranking. And the two projects that were bumped um, from uh, administration's top 10. The first one was the airport uh, apron taxiway rehabilitation project, and the other one was the critical contingency project. Any questions for Mr. Symes? Well, thank you. Guess not. Okay, so just a quick overview of uh, some of the review. So the Planning Commission did take a look at this and uh, give you their recommendation on December 6th. Uh, it was then forwarded on to us, and uh, you as a council had your first look at this on January 16th, and that was uh, our council staff review. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, on February 6th, uh, the administration uh, was invited to talk about projects. Uh, we had representatives from the administration, department directors, uh, others talk about those projects and answer questions that you had. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, uh, we did have a brief discussion again in the work session on February 27th, and again, that's where we asked you to, to rank the projects. And then later that evening on the 27th, you set the public hearing for tonight. And lastly, uh, what happens after this? Um, you will hold the public hearing, and then after, after you hold the hearing, you'll have the opportunity to consider uh, the CIP plan. Um, just as a note, there were no changes uh, proposed to the plan, so it is as it was presented to you originally. And then once adopted, that CIP will, will then be used to inform the mayor's budget, which will be presented to you the first part of May. Okay. If we've got some folks here. Uh, if you have questions for me, I'd be happy to answer those. If I can't, then uh, maybe some of these folks behind me can. Questions? Hey, I Thank think you. we've talked about it. Thank you. This is a public hearing. We'd like to hear from the public on this issue. Is there anyone that would like to address the council? Okay. We look for a motion to close the public hearing. <coughs> so, so moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Blair and a second by Vice Chair Nadalski to close the public hearing. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Look for a motion then. Chair Heyer, make a motion that we adopt proposed ordinance 2018-5. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Chair Nadalski, seconded by Councilmember Blair to adopt ordinance 2018-5. This is a roll call vote. Councilmember Jaburka? Aye. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. Councilmember Blair? Aye. Vice Chair Nadalski? Aye. Chair Heyer? Aye. That passes unanimously. And that's good. Okay. Next item uh, is public comment. We had a sign up sheet in the back. 
And uh, first one that signed up, this is not everybody that can speak, but we're going to take the people that signed up first. Christina Codlin, if you could come up and um, we know your name. Give us your address and uh, okay. tell us what um, you like. So, Mayor, Council, <laughs> men and women. Uh, my name is Christina Conlin. I live at 2181 Buchanan Avenue in Ogden, Utah. And I'm here regarding the issue of the extreme light pollution that is located at the 23rd Street Water Reservoir. I'm here representing my family, my fellow men, and the thousands of different species that share our home. What some of us have may not considered is the threat that these powerful LED lights have on our well-being and the well-being of the, our delicate ecosystem. These lights threaten the, the natural phenomenon of the biological clock that is innate in all species. This biological clock is what scientists call the circadian rhythm. One of the most important circadian rhythms is the sleep-wake cycle. When the sun goes down, darkness becomes a natural cue in our environment to alert our brains to secrete melatonin. Melatonin allows our bodies to sleep, and sleep is when our bodies repair the damage that accumulated during the day. When the sun comes up, the light serves as the natural cue to stop our bodies from secreting melatonin, and our, our bodies become aware and awake. There's a significant amount of research that shows that the exposure to LED lights suppresses the secretion of melatonin and increases the alertness. <coughs> These extreme LED lights installed at the 23rd Street Water Reservoir have a direct negative effect on the circadian rhythms of all exposed to the light. This includes the plants, animals, and the bacteria-eating microorganisms that live in the reservoir. These LED lights will inevitably lead to the deterioration of our ecosystem. We have to ask ourselves, is the pollution we're inflicting on our fellow men and our environment really helping us reach our goal? Are these lights really going to stop a crime or a terrorist attack? Based on off the research related to this topic, light exposure will only increase the alertness and accuracy of a perpetrator. I understand the rationale behind installing these lights and I understand the rationale behind upgrading to the LED version. However, the best way to save money here is to turn them off and to save our local ecosystem. And with turning them off, I feel like we can turn on the light in here and here and find a solution that truly protects our home in this great city of Ogden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lights. Yeah, we've, we've uh, seen those pictures. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Your time is up. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Now would be the time. Come, come forward if... <coughs> Uh, uh, observing and um, give, give us your name and address, please. Patrick Conlon. Sorry, I'm um, Christina's husband, and uh, we noticed that the lights were being put in last Wednesday. And um, that Thursday night, I came home, and we didn't have anything but our normal blinds, and neither one of us slept one wink that night. And I haven't slept almost at all since. We've tried to put garbage bags up on the windows and um, I suffered a uh, bad motor vehicle injury about one year almost the exactly a year ago
and I had some brain injury. So every little bit of sleep I get is very important to me. And I'm a physician, so I have to. This week's been very tough with the lights. And uh, the last lights were bad, but at least they were yellow. This LED, uh, the frequency of this light, there's something, it, it's much different. It's so bright, and, and you can't, it, it, it just doesn't allow me to sleep, and I'm sure it doesn't allow other people to sleep. So I, it's been, uh, that, so I sent some emails to you and some pictures, and uh, I appreciate you recognizing that and having us. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Good evening. Gary Schlamm, 2726 Quincy Avenue. And uh, I was watching on the television the meeting you had about contaminated our, our garbages and stuff in Ogden City. So I'd done out and done a little canvas of myself through the grocery stores. And in one week's period, Wankos, Harmons, Smiths, Fresh Value go through 10,000 plastic bags a week. 10,000 of them. I personally went around and got an idea. These bags right here are at the grocery stores. This and here I happen to get from the VA, but they've got one similar to it at the grocery stores. The problem is, is they're not being asked for. If the public knew that they had them, and there's some way that the council could help the stores, the businesses, and all the other people in Ogden go to these bags, we could eliminate a lot of the, the bio problems that we're having with the plastic bags. Okay? The second issue is chickens. In December, you passed the ordinance to allow chickens in Ogden City. January, you come up with some ordinance that's for them to, for them to follow. In December, they promised you everything in the world that they was going to do. In January, you come up with the ordinances. February, you put them out. And as of a week, two weeks ago, six people have applied for the licenses. Out of the, ch the chamber, it was full of them. I think that there's something going wrong because the people do not want to comply with what's going on. The third issue is these pods, these metal pods that their companies are bringing in and putting in people's driveways and they're sitting there for two and three months at a time, okay? Uh, if I left the trailer in my driveway, code enforcement would be right up there on me, on stuff. I don't believe that these business, these pod companies even have an Ogden City business license to be in Ogden and doing this. I'd like to see you guys look into it, see what could be done about it for it. Okay? I okay. thank you for your time. Okay, thanks, Gary. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the council? Maybe we give the administration just a minute to talk to the... Uh, sure. I appreciate your comments. And uh, I was actually out of town on Friday when I got your emails, and I forwarded them immediately to our city engineer, and they're looking into that right now. So sometimes those take a couple days to go in and look at, but I want you to know that that got our attention, and we're certainly looking into it. And so we apologize for the frustration, although we can't mediate that. So we appreciate that. And then uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't use the public opportunity to thank a number of people in this room and just basically a lot of the administrative, sa uh, administrative staff. As uh, some of us know better than others, the legislative session ended on Thursday and there were a lot of people in here that did a lot of heavy lifting. I'd like to thank Mark Johnson, Gary Williams, Mark Stratford, Chief Watt, Captain Croyal, and all the staff that had to carry the load while a lot of their bosses and administrators were gone and at the legislature for, legislature for 45 days. Um, you guys did a great job and we can't thank everybody enough. I think the workload <laughs> doubles. It's also budget season and we're going through changeover with some of our uh, electric records keeping and everything else. So I just want to thank everybody for their hard work and commitment. There is the opportunity to drop a lot of balls as it gets that crazy down there. And I don't think they've done any of that. So we appreciate what you guys have all done to help keep things moving forward and appreciate everyone's effort. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Mr. Chair, what about the metal, metal pods? Are, would code enforcement look in that or what? We noted all those comments, and yeah, we'll certainly have a conversation about that and, and some of those other things. So every time people come and take the time to spend their evenings with us and tell us about their concerns, we write them down and we bring it up and push those to the appropriate departments for inspection and, and, and consideration. Thank you. Okay, council members, any comments? I, I'd like to make one comment. Uh, I'm pleased that we had a follow-up report by uh, Mark Johnson, and uh, they are looking at the lights this evening to see if there's anything that can be adjusted to those. Uh, I went up last night, and uh, one of the uh, uh, pictures that Christine showed uh, uh, that it was illuminating on the side of the home, uh, that was a real uh, uh, picture. Uh, the lights do illuminate on, onto their home, and, and I, uh, I know the reason for that, and Mark indicated that it was uh, to protect our water uh, storage area up there, and, and that's very crucial for us. Uh, but uh, I'm glad that the administration is looking into it and uh, seeing if we can find a solution to the situation at that particular time. So I appreciate that. Anyone else? Just want to say thank you to Aiden for leading us through the pledge tonight. <laughs> hey, you did a good job. Uh, Yeah, Gary, we are. I, I think that's the the administration is is fully aware of those things, and and thank you. They're looking into that. We appreciate that. Appreciate yeah. the advice. That is that is some of the first things they'll try. So, any other council member comments? Okay. Let's. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a closed executive session. This is consideration for that. Do we have a motion? Make a motion to adjourn to a closed executive session. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Lopez, second by Councilmember Blair to adjourn into a closed executive session. This is a roll call vote. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. Councilmember Blair? Aye. Councilmember Chaburka? Aye. Vice Chair Nadolsky? Aye. Chair Heyer? Aye. That's unanimous. Uh, we will now move into a closed executive session and we will adjourn from that uh, meeting so we won't be back in here anymore. So thank you for coming everyone. Appreciate the comments that you've given us and uh, we will certainly try and be responsive to those. <laughs>